Okay. Uh, as you can tell, if you look at the handout, the material I'm going to present today is really different from uh, what I presented before. Uh, the things I presented so far are things that we think we figured out, at least figured out uh, some of, uh, been able to make work, been able to prove. Uh, I've been talking about the interaction between, you know, our account of the reason relations and the pragmatics and the logic in the semantics. Uh, they all fit together uh, uh, nicely, I think. I'll talk more about that in the concluding session next time. Uh, but today I'm talking about pie in the sky stuff where uh, we haven't figured it out. Uh, these are ongoing projects that have not yet proven themselves uh, worth, for instance, you know, including in our um, uh, in the book that we're writing. But they are things that I'm excited about. Uh, and I think they're real philosophical points uh, that come from both of them. So I just want to present present those. And the first is a computer implementation of what we call dialogic pragmatics. And here we at least do have a result in the sense of an up and running program that does what it sets out to do, and I think proves uh, a non-trivial uh, philosophical point about the approach uh, we've been making. But we're in very early stages of learning what we can in principle learn from it about the interactions between reason relations in a very abstract sense, I'm talking about as vocabularies, as um, algebraic relational structures on the one hand, and different aspects of discursive practices conducted in accordance with the norms articulated by those reason relations on the other. So I think there's some prospect of our learning really a lot from it, but so far, uh, we're not there. Uh, there aren't any particular lessons from that that I'll be able to pass on. Uh, I plan to talk about that for roughly the first half uh, of the time. Uh, in the second half, uh, I want to describe a long time fantasy of mine about the possibility of a kind of logic uh, that nobody's worried about before, and maybe for good reason, because it may not uh, in the end be a coherent aspiration that I have. Uh, but it's a possibility of a logic that is expressively complete, uh, in a sense, even more powerful than the expressive completeness result that uh, Dan Kaplan shared with us um, uh, about NMSS. And this is the idea of what I, what I call a monada logic. And by that, I mean a logic such that the logically complex consequences of each and every premise set encode the entire reason relations uh, of the language. Uh, so that if you know what follows uh, from any premise set, then you know what follows from every premise set. Uh, that, that's the expressive completeness. Now, I'll, I'll say some more about that, but you know, let me start, spoiler alert, uh, I don't know how to achieve uh, this expressive completeness. Uh, and as a result, I don't really know that it's even a coherent notion. There may be deep reasons why it's impossible to uh, do this. But I do have some, some uh, uh, ideas about how it might be done, and at least one concrete proposal that has some desirable and promising consequences that I want to share with you, uh, even though in the end I've got to say, you know, what I've got doesn't work. It, it is not uh, an up and running monada logic. So let me talk about the computer program. And uh, I'll talk about uh, a couple of later iterations of it uh, as well. So if you remember uh, right at the beginning, uh, I started talking about vocabularies uh, downstream from uh, uh, Wittgenstein and Quine, 
uh, saying really the distinction between languages and theories uh, as we inherited it from Carnap, where he says, look, first fix your meanings, settle on your language, and then find out from the world uh, what to believe, uh, what theory you should endorse. He says, that's fine for artificial languages, but in natural languages, there's just one thing. We just talk, we just use the expressions, and that has to settle uh, what we mean and what we take to be true both, uh, and following a suggestion of uh, Rorty, I suggested we talk about vocabularies uh, as being in the middle. Uh, so vocabularies are not supposed to be just the set of sentences, the lexica, but uh, those lexical items as meaning something uh, because of the way they're used. Uh, but with the aspiration of uh, capturing at least the core uh, of their use, in a set of reason relations, I also talked about a spare uh, mathematical notion uh, of a vocabulary that's just a lexicon, you know, a set of uh, things we're calling sentences, uh, and then a set of reason relations on them, uh, which can just be uh, a set of pairs of sets of sentences thought of as multi um, sequence uh, codifying implications and incompatibilities. Well, that's just an algebraic relational structure of the kind that we use as models in Tarski and model theory. There's a domain and there's a set of relations on it. The lexicon's the domain. It's a particular kind of relation that we have. That's a very abstract uh, sort of thing. It's formally tractable, but uh, we can ask about the relation between that algebraic notion of a vocabulary and the notion of a vocabulary as a set of expressions in use where uh, the domain elements are not just domain elements, they're sentences that express propositions that mean that things are uh, thus and so. And we did forge one sort of connection uh, between these. That is, uh, I also started off with an account of what it seemed to me is the core of specifically discursive practices, uh, practices in which some performances have the pragmatic significance of claims, uh, that is of acceptance or rejection of claimables, uh, and uh, in which, so by making a claim one commits oneself uh, by asserting or denying something. Uh, and uh, I want to pick out specifically discursive practices uh, by filling in what's needed for something to have that pragmatic significance of uh, a claiming by saying it has to include practices of vindicating your entitlement to those uh, commitments by uh, offering reasons for them, defending the claim, uh, and re investigating reasons against them, challenging uh, the claims. Uh, that rational articulation according to reason relations, uh, uh, I say is a good thing to mean by a discursive practice you know, in a slogan, uh, I'm disagreeing with Wittgenstein. Language does have uh, a downtown, and it's the game of making claims and giving and asking for reasons uh, for them, defending and challenging them. And we saw right at the beginning uh, that taking uh, our cue from Restall Ripley bilateralism uh, and from its development by Ryan Simonelli, we could understand implications as the relation uh, that obtains when uh, commitment to accept all of the premises precludes entitlement to deny uh, the conclusion. Uh, and we could understand incompatibility when uh, as the relation that holds between the premises and the conclusions when uh, commitment to accept all of the premises precludes entitlement to accept uh, the conclusion. 
So that was showing how we might understand reason relations uh, of implication and incompatibility in terms of uh, discursive practice. But once we put on the table this algebraic relational structure notion of vocabulary, okay, we can go from the discursive practice to reason relations, which we could represent that way. Uh, but could you go back the other way? Suppose you were only given uh, the vocabulary in the sense of a lexicon and the set of reason relations in this algebraic relational structure sense. If the story hangs together properly, then specifying a vocabulary in the abstract relational structure sense should determine the norms that govern uh, discursive practices. We ought to be able to reverse that uh, original definition. But can we actually, if, if all you had was the relational structure, uh, how can we see that as setting norms for the practices? And it seemed to me that a, a cogent justification of the claim to the pragmatic adequacy of the connection I've been trying to put in place between reason relations and discursive practices would be to show that the mere capacity to associate reason relations with lexical items as codified in the relational structure notion of a vocabulary can be algorithmically elaborated into the capacity to engage in discursive practices of making claims and defending and challenging them. Well, the algorithmic elaboration is a way of putting uh, basic uh, abilities together to make complex abilities. Uh, its home uh, is in computer programming where you have uh, some basic abilities and an algorithm that uh, combines them. So the best way to show that you could algorithmically elaborate uh, a vocabulary in the sense of a relational structure into practices of making claims and defending and challenging them by giving reasons for and against them would be to write a computer program that does that, uh, that takes as input uh, a set of reason relations to find over a vocabulary and then yields the ability, uh, exercises the ability to engage in recognizable discursive practices. So that's what we did. Uh, well, that's what uh, Pitt philosophy graduate student Yao Fan did uh, under my supervision. <clears throat> Pitt philosophy graduate student Dan Weber now maintains and extends the program and its descendants. Uh, I wrote some chunks of this code, but even where my bits did what they were supposed to do, uh, Yao had to rewrite them to be elegant and proper and play nicely with the rest of it. Every line in the code that I'm gonna talk about, Yao wrote, there isn't any of my code left in it but I'm gonna demonstrate this uh, program. Um, so what it does is take uh, a lexicon and a set of reason relations on it and outputs dialogues, giving and asking for reasons, defending and uh, challenging them. Um, now, to do this, we have to do something that we haven't done all term, you know, we've talked about reason relations in an extremely abstract way. Uh, we've never looked at any actual ones. I mean, once in a while we give an example, but a set of reason relations that confer content on sentences. Uh, we've just, you know, written algebraic expressions uh, for them. We've never looked at any actual actual ones, and now we need to. And for demonstration purposes, then, we're going to use a lexicon with just seven sentences in it. I mean, this is ludicrously uh, uh, simplified, uh, but it'll enable us to get concrete models of vocabularies that we can actually uh, roll up our sleeves and uh, 
look at uh, the details uh, of. And I want to pause a bit uh, here, and you might look at that uh, first uh, page or two of the handout. Uh, Here is uh, an actual, well, actual, a concrete model of a vocabulary. Uh, we did it with single succident implications, so just single conclusions. Uh, it was easier, and we know how to generalize uh, from there uh, anyway. So uh, on our toy lexicon of just seven I could have used sentence letters here, but we just use numerals. Uh, uh, there are 193 implications uh, in the model that we're going to look at. Uh, so you can see here, one, four, and five implies six. One, four, and six implies five. One, and four imply two. The structural principles of monotonicity uh, and transitivity uh, that are usually taken for granted in implication relations, and in the case of monotonicity, also in incompatibility. We don't impose, you know, our logic, our semantics is supposed to do without that. So we're not assuming that if one, three, and four here implies zero, that one, three, four, and five must imply, imply zero. That would be uh, a meta inference uh, a structural principle of monotonicity. We're not assuming that. Uh, and I've actually left off the list here uh, any implications that hold in virtue of containment. That is where uh, a premise set implies a conclusion because it includes the conclusion. Just that sort of clogs things up. Uh, but if you look at all of these, uh, one of the questions that might occur to you is, well, wait a minute, how many vocabularies are there on uh, a lexicon of seven sentences? And the answer is a lot. Uh, I mean, seven sentences isn't very much. Uh, even, you know, we, we don't have English grammars that generate all and only the sentences of English. But we've got lots of grammars that generate only sentences of English. Uh, and if you apply one of those to uh, the vocabulary of basic English, the lexicon of basic English, uh, it's 5,000 words, uh, and look at sentences shorter than 10, 10 words long, there's many millions uh, uh, of them, not just seven. <laughs> um, uh, but, you know, sometimes your modeling has to start uh, small, uh, start with the subsets uh, of those seven. Well, there's two to the seventh uh, of those, 128 uh, subsets of it. Uh, but now when we pick, say, the incoherent sets, uh, we're talking about taking a set of those subsets that we say, okay, this set are the incoherent ones, the ones such that any uh, uh, partition of them, any uh, two of their subsets that uh, union together make an incoherent subset are incompatible with one another. Well, how many of those are there? There's how many are how many ways of picking uh, a set of subsets uh, of that seven membered uh, lexicon are there. Well, it's two to the 14th now. Uh, that's about 10 million, 10 to the seventh, since two to the 10th is 1,024, approximately 10 to the third. And if we look at the single succident system, we see that for each conclusion, we're picking a set of premise sets that include it. Out of all the premise sets, which ones, which ones imply five? 
Well, again, we've got to pick a set of subsets, a set of these 127, uh, 128 subsets. Uh, we can do that in more than 10 million ways for each of uh, our seven sentences. Uh, and picking one of them, you know, suppose we've decided what implies one, we've got 10 million ways to do that. We've got 10 million independent ways of picking the ones that imply two and so on. Uh, that's 10 to the seventh to the eighth power. Uh, it's 10 to the 15th. That's a lot of relational structures to uh, investigate. So even our impoverished seven element lexicon generates a very large number of possible vocabularies. And at this point, I think we're reminded of our stunning ignorance about the actual reason relations in natural languages. For the next, the very next decision to make in building a concrete model of reason relations for our toy vocabulary is to ask, well, of all the subsets of these uh, seven uh, sentences, uh, how many of them should we take to be incoherent? Uh, half of them, a tenth of them, a hundredth of them? Uh, of all the subsets that could imply sentence three, about how many should we take to imply sentence three? Uh, a tenth of the possible subsets, a hundredth? Uh, what sort of distribution should we expect here? And I think we have no idea. We, we don't know what a sensible range is. If we were thinking about some actual vocabulary, nautical vocabulary, culinary vocabulary, theological or geological vocabulary. Uh, if we just had the set of sentences that geologists use, say, uh, in a geology book, uh, and looked at subsets of them and conclusions, how many of them would be reasons against this conclusion and how many of those arbitrary subsets would be reasons for? We don't know. I mean, the closest we've come to trying to get a handle on this is there is uh, uh, a public database that Stanford maintains, Sicily, the Center for uh, the Study of uh, Language and uh, Logic, anyway, uh, that consists of three quarters of a million pairs of English sentences. And they paid poor graduate students, I guess, on TaskRabbit uh, uh, some pittance for each one of these that they did, asking them, does one of these imply the other? Uh, is one of them incompatible with the other? Or are they, in that sense, irrelevant? So you just have to go through and check which of these three you have. Well, we have three quarters of a million uh, actual implications and incompatibilities uh, there. But, uh, and, and I mean, this is very useful for many things. We would like to bring it into contact with this, uh, the computer program I'm going to describe. But uh, they didn't make any attempt to sort of restrict the topics of the sentences that are in uh, this thing. And they didn't try and mix and match them so that uh, you know, sort of arbitrary pairs of the sentences they have were tested. There's some selection bias. We don't know how they picked which pairs to ask people about. And so it's very difficult to get an estimate uh, from that about uh, to the question we're asking here. Uh, so, you know, we're working in the dark and uh, about all we can do 
is explore the consequences of vocabularies having so and so many incompatibilities and so and so many uh, implications. But uh, this program is a way of doing that. Uh, it takes uh, a vocabulary thought of as a relational structure of this kind. So we've got a lexicon, we've got some implications, we've got some incompatibilities, uh, and it's gonna run a dialogue uh, on them. So if we look um, at the next page of the handout, here's a sample dialogue, and I'm gonna run the program uh, uh, live for you in a minute, we'll obviously get a different dialogue. And I should say, uh, if you think there's a lot of vocabularies definable on a seven sentence um, lexicon, and it is 10 to the 15th, as soon as you start asking how many dialogues are there where each move is giving a reason for and against, things get really large very fast. Okay, but here is one. And uh, I put this here uh, mostly so you'll understand these 13 columns uh, as it's keeping track. So the first one is the term number, turn number. Uh, this one is a 13 turn dialogue. And the next column keeps track of the just two interlocutors, CL is for the claimant, the one who first makes the claim, and CR is for the critic, uh, the one who's going to give reasons against. Um, and this is not, um, uh, though there is an element of uh, competition here, it's a cooperative enterprise. They wanna know what the reasons for and against the claim are, can you sustain an entitlement to the claim. Uh, the turn target is, well, what are you giving reasons for and against? What, what earlier claim are you uh, defending or contesting? The next column is the pragmatic significance of the move you're making. Uh, there's an original proposal. That's the move here we start well, he claims three and gives reasons for it. Uh, zero, two, and five imply three. Those are his, uh, those are his reasons. Uh, and here we get a premise challenge. He says, oh, I can give you a reason against one of those premises. Uh, zero is a reason against five. And look, you're already committed to zero here. So this is a problem for you. That's a premise challenge. Here, the claimant comes back with a conclusion challenge. He says, well, you've given a reason against five, but I've got a reason for it. Oh, that's a defense then of this premise that they're investigating. Okay, we'll walk through one of these uh, in a minute, but what the rest of these columns do is keep track of the deontic score. Oh, here is what the claimant is committed to accept at this first stage of the dialogue. He's committed to accept three because that was the claim that he made. But because he gave zero, two, and five as reasons for it, he's committed to those two, to accept those as well. So far, he's not committed to reject anything. And because we have a default and challenge structure of uh, entitlement, so far, he's entitled to those, you know, both to his conclusion and to the other claims he's made. Nobody's contested them yet. And so far, uh, the critic hasn't done anything and isn't committed to anything, uh, but he will be. Uh, so we're keeping track of the two flavors of deontic status, the commitments and entitlements uh, of each of the parties. What are they committed to accept? What are they committed to reject? What are they entitled? Which of their commitments to accept are they entitled to? Which of their rejections are they entitled to? These four for the claimant and these four 
for the critic. Now let me share the program. So I've started, I've started one, but there will be some action. We will walk through it. Uh, in this case, the vocabulary we're working with has 190 reasons for implications and 204 reasons against. And here's the dialogue uh, that, was that was run on this uh, base. We'll run some others. Uh, it's different from the one that's in your handout. As I said, there's a lot of them. Uh, the conclusion of this is uh, that the claimant's proposed conclusion was sustained. Uh, here, the original proposal uh, is that six implies five. Here, program uses sort of subscripted proposition letters instead of just uh, the numbers for some purposes, for the names of them, even though we keep track of them with numbers. And if you look at the end, what is the claimant uh, entitled to accept at the end He's entitled to accept five. Uh, he was entitled to accept five at various points, but at various points he wasn't. Uh, but at the end he is. Uh, and so uh, the conclusion is sustained. He, he ends up being able successfully to defend uh, the claim. What is the end? Well, we'll get to that. Uh, now, an interesting feature of this is and this was not something that we built in or expected. It's emergent behavior from the program. Almost always, uh, the two interlocutors end up agreeing on some things. They end up sharing some commitments and entitlements to those commitments. Uh, in this case, they both end up committed and entitled to two and six. And one of the things we're interested in using the program to investigate is what connections there are between uh, the particular constellation of reason relations that we start with, what implies what and is incompatible with what, uh, and the claim that's defended on the one hand, and what the, what the interlocutors can end up agreeing on, uh, on the other hand, as I say, they almost always do end up uh, agreeing on something. So, okay, here we can watch the program in action uh, a little bit. I, I hope you can uh, see this. So it's asking me at the bottom, do we want to walk through the inquiry stage by stage? Yes, let's do that. So here's turn number zero. The agent is the claimant. There isn't a target number because this is the first move. And here's the first move. Six entails implies five. Um, so the claimant is committed to accept the conclusion five and the reason he gave for it, six. Not committed to reject anything. Default and challenge structure of entitlement so far uh, he's entitled to those commitments. They haven't been challenged. Uh, now we're looking ahead a little bit here. Uh, at the end of this stage, the next player, the critic, whose job it is to challenge that claim, because we're investigating reasons for and reasons against, uh, has 47 moves available. Uh, he's going to make a challenge and can either offer reasons against the conclusion, reasons against five, or can contest the justification, can say, well, it doesn't matter that six implies five because, you, because six doesn't hold. You're not entitled to six. 
because here's a reason against sex. Here's a reason not to accept sex. So you see here, this is just a survey looking back over uh, all of these reasons against. Here's all the reasons uh, against five and six that are compatible with the commitments that the critic has already got, but he doesn't have any yet. So these are just all of the ways of challenging either the conclusion or in this case, the single reason that was given for it. But uh, at the end of the first stage, uh, the claimant is entitled to the commitment to the conclusion five. No challenges have been made yet. You know, that's taking longer than I thought it was going to. Ugh. Okay. Oh, uh, that's moving ahead here. I'm not sure what uh, the trouble was there. Oh, uh, but okay. So, what happened was the Critic made a conclusion challenge. He said, well, look, I'm gonna give you a reason against your conclusion. Zero, one, two, four, and six excludes five. Uh, that removes the claimant's entitlement to five. Uh, it commits the critic to a lot of stuff, to accept a lot of stuff. All his conclusion and his arguments commits him to reject five and because he hasn't been challenged on any of this, uh, at that second stage, he's uh, entitled to all of that. And then the claimant comes back with a premise challenge. He says, well, it doesn't matter. The justification you gave for rejecting five depends on uh, a bad claim. Uh, it depends on A0, that was one of your premises, but A6, one of your own premises uh, is incompatible with that. Um, and now you can see uh, the next player, the critic, has got some four moves he can give. Uh, these are all justifications of, of his premise, A0, uh, which was challenged in the previous stage, or he can give reasons against, well, for instance, the reason that was given uh, against A0. Uh, but he's now committed to a bunch of stuff, and that cuts down what moves he has available. We're going to go on with this until somebody... Uh, doesn't have a move left. Now, what I'm gonna do instead is use a different uh, capability of the program and rerun this from an earlier stage. So suppose at stage one, we'd had a different move. Uh, now, the dialogue goes differently. If you look at this one, and this one, these are substantially different dialogues. This one had 13 steps and ended with uh, an implication of A1. This one only has 11 steps, ends with an entailment of zero. The other one, the first one sustained the conclusion, this rejects it. But uh, notice that the common ground here was two and six, on this rerunning, quite different, same common ground. Something about this set of reason relations together with this uh, claim, A5, is leading to uh, is leading to agreement on uh, these two claims.
so we can step through this uh, and see at each stage as the commitments uh, accumulate, fewer and fewer moves are possible here. And we're just running each of these uh, dialogues until there's nothing anybody can say anymore. I mean, this is why it ends, uh, because there's no moves left for the claimant uh, to make to change the score uh, in any way. And we could rerun this again. And this time the claim is sustained. It's the very same common ground that we get. Uh, there's something robust about uh, two and six that you end up entitled to those, uh, given this set of reason relations, if you end up, uh, if you begin by making the claim five. So one of the things we could look at is, uh, well, what would come up if your initial claim was four instead of five, let's say. Yes, Anne. Well, I have some questions both on uh, input setting and the program itself. So first on on the vocabulary, can, can you see the your PDF handout handout mm -hmm. for this week? Yeah, let me go to that. Uh, yeah. So on the second page. Uh, on the inco incompatibility relations. Oh, uh -huh. yeah, yeah. So on, on the second page, the last part of the second page, uh, it starts, not page three, I mean page two, the earlier page. Oh, yeah, thank you. So the first element of the second line and the third line indicates actually the same set a set of 0, 1, 2, 3, and 5 is incoherent. Yes. Yeah. So I I think they are just the same. There is just one same relation that in, expressed by both elements. So we add them separately just for the convenience in our program. Right. But, but if, if I understand uh -huh. what you're saying correctly uh -huh. what we're saying is the set of zero one two three and five is incoherent yes and that's going to have if we write them out this way uh -huh. uh, that's going to be expressed in a number of uh, incompatibilities that is zero one two and five will also be incompatible uh -huh. with three uh -huh. and we do in in the program as it's building uh -huh. these uh, vocabularies mm -hmm. it does build in symmetry so mm -hmm. it, the way it's determining the incompatibilities in this single succulent form is by picking a set of incoherent uh, sets mm -hmm. uh, and so then it will generate all of all of those and that's a structural difference that mm -hmm. that doesn't you know, it's yeah. not like that for the implications uh, up here uh, for the implications it really matters what's on the right and what's on the left of the turnstile, mm -hmm. but for the incompatibilities, it doesn't. Mm -hmm. And you remember we had uh, a discussion about this mm -hmm. striking structural difference between the two. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I rehearsed Ryan Simonelli's argument, I think convincing pragmatic argument for why that's true. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, and I was wondering whether we can add empty set our as our premise set to express something necessary truth or necessary force. If it is implicated by empty set, it would be necessarily true. Well, in ordinary logic, 
Mm -hmm. That's what you think. You say, well, in the ordinary se sequence calculus, uh, classic Genson style, mm -hmm. uh, what implies, uh, what is implied by the empty set is a theorem, uh, mm -hmm. and what implies the empty set is incoherent. That's the way he uses the, the empty sides. Mm -hmm. In our substructural uh, setting, that isn't a useful notion of theorem because uh, we don't have monotonicity, or at least we're not imposing it globally. Mm -hmm. So from the fact that, say, five uh, follows from the empty set, mm -hmm. it doesn't follow that it follows from all the other premise sets. Uh, mm -hmm. It might not follow from one or from one and two. Uh, it would if monotonicity held. But our notion of theorem has to be what follows from every premise set. Uh, so to express logical through truth, we needed to add or the pro A or sort the of quantifier over it. Uh, um, and it, oh, this came up, though it went by rather quickly in Dan's discussion, that the key notion in the non-monotonic setting is which implications are persistent in that if this premise set implies the conclusion, then so do all the other ones that you add anything to this premise set. All the supersets of this one also imply it. And, and that's the sort of the notion of a, of a theorem would be something that was persistently implied by the empty set uh, or by any set. Mm -hmm. Uh, and that notion of uh, a persistent implication is a, a local bit of monotonicity. Uh, okay, though monotonicity doesn't hold globally, it holds locally in that uh, this implication is robust under the addition of arbitrary uh, auxiliary hypotheses or collateral premises. Uh, and it turns out we can mark that by introducing a modal operator, a box, uh, and saying, if a premise set gamma implies A persistently, then we can say it doesn't just imply A, it implies box A. And so can capture, can express uh, local regions of monotonicity in the, um, in the vocabulary. Now, though the program is entirely capable of mm -hmm. calculating that. Indeed, the program, not the front end I'm using here, but the underlying program calculates the V sets of things as well. Uh, it can quantify like that and so could distinguish the persistent um, implications mm -hmm. and, and so tell us where there are boxes, but we're not doing that with it. And I also have a question on the process of programs. So it seems like the, this program presupposes that all interlocutors share the same reason relations, right? Oh, uh, yes and no. The way <laughs> I run it, it does. Uh, but, oh, uh, uh, well, here, uh, let, let me show you. Um, that's the good thing about having the program. Um, let's go down here and get out of this. Okay, there we are. And we'll run it again. Uh, use the default parameters, and I'll say no. No, no, I will. I will say yes. We do. Um, and now. It put together a whole vocabulary, a whole set of reason relations. Mm -hmm. But uh, each interlocutor has control of a different, is aware of a different part of it. Mm -hmm. So has an inferential theory. Uh, so here's the set of reasons for that are in claimant's inferential theory mm -hmm. up here. Here are the reasons against the, the incompatibilities in seals theory. 
here's the same thing for CR, and here's what's in common. Here are the bits of the vocabulary that they agree about. And so the whole reason relations are the yeah. same, but each right. interlocutor but, but they take have, part of. Yeah, they, they each only have parts of them. Uh -huh. uh, and in a later iteration, the, mm -hmm. this uh, particular front end isn't using that. We can use different ones. Mm. But the thought is that you know what we're modeling is where they agree about meanings mm -hmm. uh, and are deciding what to believe given those meanings. So the meanings determine what's a reason for what. Uh, and they agree about the meaning. So they agree about what's a reason for and against what. Um, so they, they are agree on the meaning because they share the background vocabulary. Right. Uh -huh. So they challenge commitments to the sentences, but mm -hmm. in this program, they can't say, oh, I don't agree that that follows. Now, mm -hmm. uh, if we look at the handout in DP2, the next program, uh, they're contesting uh, the meanings. They're trying to build up uh, a vocabulary. Uh, here, the first move uh, is to say, well, I claim that one, two, four, five, and six imply zero. And the other one says, okay, I accept that. Oh, uh, here, response, I claim the two, three, four, and six are incompatible with one. And here the response is, well, I'm willing to accept that and add it to our stock of agreed upon reason relations, provided you'll agree to add this other one. That is, oh, uh, I'll agree that two, three, four, and six are a reason against one if you'll agree that two, three, four, five, and six are a reason for one. That is, that your reason is defeasible. And here in this program, here are some of these moves. Uh, so here the agents are called cooperative and random just because of the strategies that they're using in doing this. So uh, the first one says two, three, four, and six are a reason against one. That's my proposal. Would you accept that? And the other interlocutor says, well, I would accept that if you'll accept this, that that's no longer true if we throw five in there. And that proposal is accepted. Here's a more complicated case. Proposal four and six implies zero. Well, I would accept that if you'd accept that two defeats that. He says, no, I won't accept that. Well, new proposal, uh, would you accept four and six implies zero? Well, yes, if you'd accept that if you throw in three and one, three and five, that defeats it. No, won't accept that. Oh, uh, another try. Yes, and you get a counter move. He says, okay, I'll accept four, six, four and six implies zero. If you'll accept the two, three, four and six rule, rule it out. And he says, well, I'll accept those two with you if you'll accept that if you throw in five as well, then it does imply zero. Okay, they agree with that. Uh, I mean, what's going on in the second program is we're trying to get them to uh, extend that they have very limited initial commitments as to what follows from what, and they're trying cooperatively to extend uh, uh, their reason relations uh, by making proposals like this. And uh, in, in, in this program, 
uh, its participants cannot make any mistake and they cannot co be committed to incoherent commitments because it's fixed by our input vocabulary. That's true. Uh, so it, it's a kind of program about ideally rational discursive practice. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. no, no, nobody is being irrational uh, mm -hmm. uh, in this. Okay, thank you. Okay, so look, here's the uh, first sort of philosophical point from this. It actually is possible to derive appropriate norms governing social discursive practices of making claims and challenging and defending them uh, and keeping track of the evolution of commitments and entitlements. Uh, if all you start with is a vocabulary in this uh, abstract algebraic relational structure sense, uh, that really is enough. Uh, uh, to do this. Uh, Dan Weber, who's maintaining this, uh, points out that this DP1 program uh, is the kind of the kind of interaction it's modeling is something like high school debate. Somebody has a claim and they give reasons for it, and the other, the critic objects to the conclusion maybe objects to the reasons you gave for it. Uh, you have to then respond uh, by objecting to, you know, some of the reasons that the critic gave. Um, and uh, we see whose commitment they're still entitled to when there aren't any reasons to give anymore. Um, and I mean, some of these, if you set up the reason relations right, we get very long. Um, uh, dialogues. But this means that we do have the resources to go in both directions. Uh, from uh, dialogic pragmatics, we can define what we mean by implication and uh, incompatibility in terms of commitment to accept all the premises, precluding entitlement to reject the conclusion, and so on. And we can go the other way. If, if you give me a vocabulary in this abstract algebraic sense, uh, we can say concretely what uh, the norms governing a dialogue are and see that these are sufficient to you know, conduct actual dialogues. Second point, and this is where we're really in the infancy. Uh, I pointed out how stunningly ignorant we are about basic facts about real reason relations. How many implications are there, good implications are there, out of the whole set of possible implications? How many uh, of the sets of sentences are incoherent? Oh, uh, you know, as a proportion for any, we don't know. Uh, we don't know what the relevant respects of similarity among reason relations are. And by relevant respects of similarity, I mean the ones that matter for features of the dialogues that result from them. Uh, in particular, two features that uh, are significant features of the dialogues that we get are uh, which reason relations make it easier to become entitled to a commitment to a particular claim. So some reason relations make it very easy to sustain entitlement to a commitment to proposition four and very difficult to sustain entitlement to a commitment to accept proposition two. Uh, well, what features of the reason relations is it that do that? And as I mentioned, uh, almost always there will be some agreement they're not trying to come up with an agreement, but just by reasoning in this way, they end up with some common commitments that they're both entitled to. Uh, and those are relatively robust. If you fix the initial claim and fix the reason relations, they don't always agree 
on the same propositions. But there's a small set that keeps coming up that they do. Well, what features of the reason relations is it that makes that uh, happen, that, that makes that common ground relatively robust? It's clear from playing with this that some sets of reason relations make it much easier to sustain entitlement to some commitments than to others. And some vocabularies make it easier for different interlocutors to agree about and become jointly entitled to some claims rather than others. So the, the larger project, uh, sort of the next thing we'd like to do is see whether we can use uh, this program uh, with these sort of output measures in the dialogues as a probe to figure out what relevant respects of similarity of reason relations are. Uh, with this program, we can and have run 10,000 dialogues on the same set of reason relations uh, and then run another 10,000 on an only slightly different set of reason relations and look statistically at uh, what the relations between these are. And there's sort of some tantalizing results from this, but uh, basically we haven't got anything, uh, any powerful, fabulous result uh, from this. Uh, now, the following train of thought might be fanciful, but I see a connection here with traditional philosophical concerns behind what are what have been called coherence theories of truth. You know, the, the vague thought behind such theories is that what it is for a claim to be true is for it to hang together rationally with other claims in some specific ways. Now, I don't think it can be said that anyone ever actually worked out a theory of sort of what the reason relations are such that uh, uh, hanging together in that way, being mutually supportive, offering reasons for each other and reasons against the things that are outside of the set works. But the idea is that truth talk is a misleading way of talking about how the elements of some rationally coherent set of commitments hang together by providing reasons for each other and reasons against things that are outside of it. Oh, uh, I mean, that's the general uh, idea. And one way of following that out, of trying to be more precise about this um, not very respectable uh, philosophical view, is that if you understood all the reason relations in which sentences stand to one another, then you'd understand which ones you could be entitled to commit, entitled to commitments to accept or reject. Uh, and the idea is that being justified in that holistic sense uh, was a notion that could do a lot of the explanatory work that the notion of truth was called upon to do otherwise. Uh, and if you think about it this way, uh, a coherence theory of truth would have two parts. First, a holistic coherence theory of meaning or content in terms of role in reason relations, the sort that matter for justification. That's really where I think sort of the home of coherence theories is, is in theories of meaning, not in theories of truth. But then in the second step, you'd understand the truth of sets of claimables in terms of some sort of ideal justificatory relations that they stand in to one another. Now, probably the sensible view is that the first step makes sense and the second one doesn't, that you shouldn't go on to the second step. But one thing that speaks against sort of rejecting the second step is the observation I mentioned before, common to Wittgenstein and Quine, that agreement in meanings is not really separable from agreement in claims. You know, Wittgenstein says, funny as it seems that to agree in meaning, you also have to agree, uh, agree in your verdicts on the truth of some sentences. 
And Quine says, deciding what you mean and deciding what you believe are really two sides of one process. You can't do one uh, in isolation from the other. And it's in the context of that sort of debate that it seems to me we might uh, get some illumination from using a program like this to investigate the way in which some constellations of reason relations make it much easier to become entitled to commitments to accept or reject some claims rather than others. Uh, that isn't enough for them to be true, but some commitments are easier to sustain entitlement to in the context of this set of reason relations than others are, and easier for uh, interlocutors who are critically challenging each other's claims to come to agree, oh, well, but at least these uh, we can both be entitled to. So you can see how uh, sort of truths could emerge from meanings in uh, this way. Uh, at any rate, that's a reason to think that it's not, um, that we're not just playing around uh, here with this, uh, uh, with this program. And, you know, let me mention in passing, I said that the DP1 program can also, also does calculate the V functions of uh, these uh, implications, say, that is, which other premise sets can you conjoin with these with this one and still keep the, the implication being good? Uh, and if you look at inclusion relations among those V sets, uh, so uh, everything uh, that defeats this implication defeats this other implication. Look at relations like that. Uh, everything that defeats any implication of five defeats uh, implications of three, for instance. Uh, we know, Dan went through the argument uh, that that's uh, the logic of premissory meta inferences. Can you substitute uh, A for B as a premise uh, without turning any good implications bad? And that, the, that in the context of containment of CO, that logic is K3, um, um, uh, is uh, the weak cleaning three, three valued logic. Uh, so we actually know something about uh, doing meta inferences in these uh, contexts. Now, uh, Successor programs, DP2 and DP3, uh, do exist. Dan Weber is actively working on DP3. Uh, they're supposed to go the other way around. They're supposed to have, to, to start off, let me talk about DP3, um, uh, interlocutors who uh, have some agreement, but some difference in meanings, but uh, really very few implications and incompatibilities that they already accept. Uh, and they're negotiating with each other, uh, wanting to extend the reason relations they have to find out what else follows from what uh, in a cooperative uh, enterprise to build up a fuller set of reason relations. Now, I mentioned our stunning inference, uh, our stunning ignorance, how large do you want them to get? How many implications and incompatibilities should they be aiming for? If you get too many, uh, the thing's going to get clogged up. Uh, but you know, we just don't know. But we we do look at ways of uh, making meta inferences that they can agree about. Well, if these three implications hold, then probably this other one does too. Uh, and there's various principles like that. I mean, monotonicity is a principle like that. Transitivity is a principle like that. Uh, that's what sequent calculus tells you. If these sequence hold, what does that tell you about what other sequence do? Uh, the idea of DP3 is to have them build up 
their um, reason relations, their vocabularies from these sort of partial vocabularies to fuller vocabularies uh, where they will have substantial overlap, but also since they start in different places, they're each uh, going to have some, you know, add something. One of them will add something that the other one isn't willing to add, that they'll still have different ones, but with some uh, overlap. And in the otherwise not so satisfactory DP, DP2 program, uh, we've been able to daisy chain that with DP1. That is use the output that, of the reason relations that they agree about as the input to DP1 to then run uh, dialogues uh, with. Uh, and one you know, pious hope is that looking at that interaction uh, where you're going both directions uh, is a better way to look at the interaction of what you mean and what you believe that Quine and Wittgenstein were talking about, uh, the interaction between commitments to sentences and commitments to implications and incompatibilities, how those uh, are related to each other, uh, that by looking at these daisy-chained uh, programs, where on the one hand, you're using the reason relations that you have to wrangle about what you should be committed to and entitled to. Uh, and on the other hand, uh, uh, engaging dialogically to extend the reason relations uh, that you have build up more common ground, but also to extend uh, the ones you have. So, um, we're building a toolkit here, uh, but we haven't done the experiments. We haven't sort of found out anything really exciting uh, here. What we do find, uh, you would think that what claims it's easier to sustain entitlement to might just be a function of whether there's like more reasons for it than there are against it in the, uh, in the vocabulary. And that does make a difference, uh, but it's not the biggest thing. Uh, it turns out the interactions of uh, the role this thing plays as a premise and the role it plays as a conclusion in the whole set of reason relations, there's some structural features of these complicated relational structures uh, with many thousands of entries uh, in them. Uh, there's some structural features of those that we don't understand that uh, are contributing to this, uh, to this behavior. So this is a research pro um, project. Uh, if you go to the website now, <clears throat> I put the Python code for the basic program, DP1 uh, is there. And the one I was running is a user-friendly front end for it that sort of knows how to call things in there and sort of make it work. Uh, but, but it does lots of things. We have other front ends for it. But just so you could use it, you know, if you want to uh, explore the kind of thing I was uh, uh, doing here in class, the Python code is, uh, is there. Uh, the front end is, of course, not very big, a couple hundred lines. Uh, DP1 is like 2,500 lines of code. Uh, uh, it, it's a serious uh, uh, program. But anyway, it's uh, there for you to look at if, uh, and play with if uh, you like. Um, okay, uh, after the break, I'm gonna turn to something completely different to, to the uh, uh, other project from the Skunk Works here. Uh, the speculative uh, projects. Any last questions or comments about this uh, uh, computer program I did the dog and pony show for? Can I ask a question on the coherent theory of truth? Please. Uh -huh. oh, is, is that position incompatible with the graph abundance theory of truth? Because since we so we so the isomorphism between 
in normative bilateralism to truth maker semantics. If we can argue this co this coherence shows some isomorphism to the actual states in the truth maker semantics, I think we can accept both coherentism and correspondence theory for truth. I think so too, though, <laughs> though, you know, because I think the uh, the truth maker semantics is the most sophisticated correspondence mm -hmm. uh, uh, theory uh, that's using truth as part of a theory of meaning uh, in the implication uh, space semantics. We don't talk about truth, uh, but it maps on to talk about commitment to accept and reject and so on in a way that, as you say, we've got a strong isomorphism with. So, you know, one of the overall lessons and one of the overall claims of the book is supposed to be, yeah, we can see that we're using different vocabularies to talk about the same thing. Both semantics are both the implication space semantics, which is a coherence theory of meaning anyway. Um, uh, that I say exactly what that has to do with truth. Well, we use a notion of commitment to accept uh, that's taking true in the semantics, uh, in the pragmatics anyway. Uh, we mean to be showing the relations between these. Uh, both those semantics use commutative monoids with distinguished sets, the possible states and the uh, in the truth maker semantics and the good implications in the other. And we can show this uh, isomorphism that goes all the way over to the pragmatics between the taking true. Uh, and we hope that this is a uh, conceptual setting in which we can be much more definite and um, articulate about the relations between meaning and belief, between truth and uh, inference uh, than we have before. That's, that, that's the goal. Yeah. So, yeah, suitably elaborated versions of these theories ought to not just be compatible, they should be identical. Uh, but uh, at least Wolf has some isomorphic and uh, that, that's not nothing. Okay, uh, it's 2.20, uh, let's come back at 2.35. Okay, this uh, last bit, uh, I don't have any uh, toys to show off and don't have a result uh, here, but um, some, you know, here's an idea that I'm taken with that arises out of some fairly fundamental features of the framework we've been working with. Uh, so think about the sense in which the conditional and negation uh, in NMMS uh, are intentional connectives. Uh, remember, we divide the connectives into the expressive ones, the conditional and the negation. Uh, those are the principal connectives and the sort of auxiliary, merely aggregative uh, Boolean helper monkeys of disjunction and conjunction. Um, and if you think uh, semantically about uh, implications, and for now, let's think in a single succident uh, system. So our implications have single conclusions and our incompatibilities data. So think about semantic space as a set of premise sets. All the premise sets from your lexicon, uh, however big that is, it needn't just be seven. Uh, you know, now we're, we're happy to have um, uh, much larger, even infinite uh, uh, sets. Um, and you know, imagine them arranged in some space um, where ones that are only a little bit different 
you know, have mostly the same elements are sort of near each other. Uh, but each one of them has two different kinds of cloud around it. Uh, one of them, one of the clouds is everything that's implied uh, by it. And if we have containment, we say, okay, if A is part of gamma, then gamma implies A. If A is an explicit part of, is explicitly contained in gamma, then it's implicitly contained in gamma, it's implied by it. So that cloud uh, encompasses the premise set, but it includes stuff that is not in uh, the premise set. In effect, any way you can think of that as the stuff that premise set makes true. Uh, it's what it implies. Uh, at this point of semantic evaluation, this premise set, uh, the elements of that premise set are true, and these other ones are true too. Or you can think of it, if these are true, then uh, these others uh, are. And then there's also the incompatibility, the, the sentences that are incompatible with that premise set. Uh, that in most cases doesn't include what's in gamma, though in some cases it does, but th those are sort of pathological cases. Uh, but you can think about those sentences as the ones that are made false by, uh, by that premise set at that point of uh, evaluation. I mean, this is making the implication space picture look more like a possible world and what's true at the possible world or uh, a state and what that state makes true or false, except we're doing it all with sentences. And that's the um, inferentialist uh, picture. Uh, now, uh, our conditional, uh, if we want to know whether gamma implies A arrow B, uh, you can't just look at what follows from gamma, at what it implies and what's incompatible with it. The, the rule is that gamma implies A arrow B if adding A to gamma as a further premise has B as, as a consequence. That is to say that in order to evaluate whether A arrow B is made true at gamma, you can't just look at gamma. You have to look at its neighbor, gamma plus A. And similarly for negation, if you want to know whether gamma implies, uh, whether gamma is incompatible with A, it's not enough to know what gamma makes false in the sense of rules out is incompatible with. You've got to know what gamma plus A rules out or is incompatible with. Because uh, that's what we need to see as um, uh, incoherent. But focus on the conditional. Uh, in, a in a possible world setup, uh, the property is extensional if, uh, in order to know whether the sentence is true at this possible world, we only need to look at this possible world. If, as for, a, for instance, a paradigmatically intentional uh, claim like a modal claim, a box claim or a diamond claim, assess your possibility, you have to look at all the accessible uh, possible worlds in order to know whether uh, this one makes box A or possibly A true. So the fact that you have to look at other points of semantic evaluation to tell what's true or false at this semantic point of evaluation, that's what intentionality with an S comes to in uh, semantics. And we have that analog uh, here. To, to know whether uh, this premise set implies the conditional, whether it makes the conditional true, you have to look at the neighboring um, uh, premise set, not just gamma, but gamma union uh, A. Uh, and if you wanna know whether uh, gamma implies B arrow C, you need to look at gamma plus B uh, and so on. 
So these are intentional. Uh, you need to look at the sort of suppositional neighbors of uh, uh, of A, uh, of gamma, not just at uh, gamma. But you get something for that. Uh, we can turn that around. If you want to know whether gamma implies A or B, you have to look at someplace other than gamma. But if you do know that gamma implies A or B, that's giving you information not just about what follows from gamma, but what follows from what's made true by uh, its suppositional neighbor, gamma, if you in addition suppose A, uh, if you add to it, or gamma together with B if the conditional. So this is a key, this intentionality is a key to the expressive function of this logical vocabulary that, uh, the logically complex consequences of each premise set incorporate information, not just about the consequences of gamma, but also about the consequences of other neighboring premise sets. Uh, now, uh, all of those premise sets are supersets of gamma. Uh, there are things you get by adding something to gamma. Uh, you add the antecedents of the conditionals and see what uh, the consequences are. Uh, you add A to gamma and see whether that gives you an incoherent set, not enough to know whether gamma is incoherent. Uh, and it's not so all the premise sets that the logically complex sentences, consequences of gamma are giving you information about are supersets of gamma. But it's not just that the logically complex consequences of gamma give you some information about what follows from its supersets. No, it gives you complete information about them. Uh, it codifies everything that follows from gamma plus A. We just need to check which conditionals with A as an antecedent are true. And it gives you all the information about gamma plus A plus B. Again, we look at the conditionals where we've added A and B uh, to it. So all the information about all the supersets of gamma, of every gamma, all the way up to the whole language, which we stipulate has to be incoherent and which implies itself, it implies everything. Uh, but it's not just that we get some information about those supersets, we get complete information about it. We know everything that follows from all of them. If we just know what the logically complex consequences of gamma are. So these two observations about the expressive role of intentional sentential operators, that they're being intentional. So their evaluation at one point of semantic evaluation depends on what's true at other semantic, it's true or false, at other points of semantic evaluation. In our case, what uh, this premise set provides reasons for or reasons against for intentional things depends on what other premise sets provide reasons for and against. But we can turn that notion of intentionality around or notice that it means that uh, the intentional consequences of uh, each premise set give us information, not just about what that premise set makes true or false gives us reasons for or against, uh, but what its supersets do. That observation, together with the observation that uh, the conditional application that we've introduced are expressively complete for all the supersets of each point of evaluation of each uh, premise set. 
Well, those two observations together invite a further expressive ambition. Wouldn't it be great if we could introduce intentional vocabulary that didn't just codify uh, information about what followed from the supersets of that uh, premise set, but about all of them, uh, what follows from all of the premise sets. I mean, as a start, how about codifying what follows from the subsets of uh, a premise set instead of just the supersets? Now, here's an observation. If we could codify the consequence in logically complex consequences of a premise set, what happens not just when you add premises to it, but what follows when you take them away, that would actually let us codify the consequences of every premise set. Or if let's say the premise sets are all finite because you can turn any one into any other one by adding ones that, so, so we can turn gamma into delta by first adding everything to gamma that's in delta that isn't in gamma, and then subtracting from that result everything that's uh, in gamma and not in delta. By, by going up and going back down, uh, we can get from any finite premise set to any other finite premise set. Uh, or even if we allow infinite ones, some of them are only finitely different from each other. And those we could get, and maybe that would be good enough. We might have a compactness result that said, if you can do that, then you can draw conclusions about everything. But let's just talk about the finite ones. Uh, then, uh, in the same way that with NMMS, uh, the logically complex consequences of each premise set encodes complete information about the consequences, all the consequences of all of its supersets. We would, we're fantasizing about introducing intentional vocabulary that would let us encode in the logically complex consequences of each premise set, all the information about the consequences of every premise set. That's a kind of expressive completeness. You know, we can say uh, our conditional gives us, it is expressively complete uh, for all the supersets of every, of every premise set. Uh, it encodes all the information about what follows from that. Now that's a limited kind of expressive completeness because it's only some of the other premise sets that it has all the information about, namely the supersets of each one. But this gives us the idea, well, is it possible in principle to be really expressively complete, to be able to do for all the premise sets, uh, to, to encode in the consequences of each premise set gamma, uh, the consequences of every premise set in the sense in which our conditional encodes in the conditionals that are consequences of gamma, all the information about what follows from some, some premise sets, namely the supersets uh, of gamma. That's what I call a monadologic. I mean, whether I'm calling something actual that, you know, could, could there actually be something like that? There's an aspiration, an expressive aspiration. I call it a monadologic looking at Leibnizian monads, right? Each Leibnizian monad encodes all the information about all the other monads in its universe in it. If any of them were different, if any monad anywhere in the universe were different than it is, each monad in the universe would be different in some way, in such a way that 
uh, for Leibniz, if you knew everything about any one monad, uh, that implies everything that's true of every, every monad. Each one, he says, is a mirror of all of the others. Uh, each one is a microcosm of uh, every other one. They only differ from each other. Uh, well, I'm sort of moving into the, this is the way I read Leibniz and you can read my article on him in Tales of the Mighty Dead, uh, if you like. Uh, they differ only in how that information is encapsulated. Uh, so they have different confusions and marrings of their mirror, which are made up for by uh, uh, other bits of it. So the whole package of information is the same in every monad, but it's divided up into properties of the monad differently. That's the differences between them. And those differences are reflected in the other monads too. So you not only know how the universe is, but you know how it looks from every other perspective. Uh, and in this logic, uh, in a monadal logic, uh, you would know how the universe looked from the point of view of every premise set. That is what that premise set made true and false, what it ruled in and ruled out. Uh, again, could there be such a thing? Well, you can see why uh, we logical expressivists think, well, but that would be the grail, wouldn't it? If we could, we could, get, if we could get that. Uh, now, here's another way of thinking about what the aspiration is. If you don't like the Leibnizian conceit, say, uh, a monadal logic would be completely and perfectly holographic. Here, so, I mean, this is a metaphor, but it's the constitutive metaphor of holography. Um, so a standard pictorial transformation of a scene into an image. Uh, so we got a photograph of the scene. Uh, each contiguous bit of the image encodes information about a contiguous part of the scene. So if you rip off the corner of the photograph, you lose 100% of the information about sort of the 10% of the scene that was represented in that part of the image. In a holographic image, that information is scrambled around and spread around so that if you tear off 10% of the corner of the hologram, there isn't any particular part of the scene that you lose all the information about. The whole scene just is 10% blurrier. You've lost 10% of the resolution of the whole scene because the information is spread around over the whole uh, film. And of course, this was typically done, it's still typically done, uh, coding waveforms using Fourier transforms of them. That's how classical holography works, but it doesn't matter. The idea of holographic representation is where you've uh, transcended the atomistic one-on-one -on -one, um, correspondence uh, and have holistically encoded all the information such that uh, losing part of the representation uh, loses some information about the whole scene, but doesn't lose all the information about any particular part of what it was a representation of. And in this case, uh, tearing off what corresponds to tearing off the part of the image, uh, part of the picture, would be not knowing for some premise sets what followed from. It. So we just say, okay, that's dark. Uh, we're ignorant about that. But luckily, in a monadal logic, that same information is encoded in the consequences of every premise set that we do know the consequences of. We can recover uh, that information perfectly. It doesn't even get blurrier in a monadal logic because in the consequences of each premise set, we've encoded the consequences of all the others. As long as there's any of it left, if you know the consequences of any single premise set, 
we have packed into its logically complex consequences, the entire vocabulary, all the reason relations are now expressed in the logically complex consequences of each premise set. Uh, that's a complete and perfectly holographic representation. That's what a monad logic would be. Full disclosure, I don't have one, uh, but you can see why uh, the game seems worth the candle, why this seems worth uh, getting. And I do have an idea about how one might go about doing this. Uh, and here maybe it's worth our looking at the handout. Um, while we're looking through all this good stuff. Um, okay. Yeah, there's the Manetta logic. So here's the means. Let's get a downward conditional. Our conditional adds things. So, oh. Uh, here at the top, we have the deduction detachment condition on conditionals, it's the dual Ramsey condition that says gamma implies A arrow B in case adding A to gamma yields a premise set that implies B. Now that we can make work. And NMMS has not been running system with that conditional. It's an upward condition. Uh, it involves looking at supersets of gamma and seeing what uh, follows from those neighboring premise sets that are supersets of gamma. A downward conditional by analogy would have gamma implying a downward arrow B, and I put the little superscripted minus there to uh, show this, just in case, if you took A away from gamma, you get a premise set that implies B. It's exactly parallel to the upward uh, conditional. The upward conditional looks at what follows from the premise set you get by adding a premise to gamma. The downward conditional would look at what follows from the premise set you get by subtracting something. Now, it's special to our non-monotonic setting that when you take things away, you might get more consequences than you had, uh, than gamma had. But uh, the notion makes sense even in a, of a downward conditional makes sense even in a monotonic setting uh, because you still wanna know what that follows from gamma already followed uh, from gamma minus A. Uh, you know, wasn't new to gamma, but was already a consequence of this subset of it. And the thought is, well, let's just codify that in a kind of conditional that'll be a downward conditional in the same sense in which what we had was an upward conditional. And then the thought is uh, that if you had something that worked like that, if you had a downward conditional, then just as the pure upward conditionals codify in the logically con complex consequences of gamma, complete information about what follows from all its supersets, the logically complex downward conditionals that are consequences of gamma would include complete information about what follows from all of gamma's subsets. And should we be lucky enough that we can mix and match these uh, upward and downward conditionals, uh, then we'd be able to codify in the, co the compounded upward and downward conditionals that are a consequence of gamma, everything that's a consequence of any premise set delta, again, we'll use upward conditionals to get some common superset of 
uh, gamma and delta, and then use downward conditionals to get back down to delta, taking everything out of that superset, that common superset uh, that's in gamma but isn't in delta. That's an idea about how you might uh, implement a downward conditional. Well, how a downward conditional might make a monadologic possible. This expressively uh, complete uh, logical extension of uh, one set of reason relations to one that has this uh, perfect holographic monadological property. Uh, so really two ideas so, so far. Uh, one is the idea of a monadologic, um, of something that was doing what the upward conditional does for the supersets of each premise set uh, for every for every premise set. Uh, and then second, the idea that uh, because it's the upward conditionals that are doing that, if we introduced an analogous downward conditional, that that would let us do, do this, at least if it had the right properties and didn't blow up the system and so on. So those are the two ideas. I'm an analogic, here's what it would have to do. And then the second idea, and let's try to do that by introducing a downward conditional. So here's a concrete proposal. Uh, there are the rules of NMMS, our well-behaved uh, system, which uh, will extend open structured base vocabularies, the reason relations of them to um, reason relations on the logically extended language. Uh, in ways that have nice properties. And let's introduce the downward conditional with two new rules. Uh, one is the analog of the dual Ramsey conditional that I suggested on the right. And now because NMMS is in the uh, multi succinct system, I'm uh, shifting over to that. Gamma is a set. We have questions about whether we want to build in contraction. Should we use multi sets? We're just doing this as plain, and maybe we need to on down the line, given that this isn't actually quite going to work. Maybe that's the way we need to go. But uh, set theoretic subtraction is as well defined an operation as set theoretic addition. We have a premise set, uh, we take A away from it. Uh, if, when you look at the premise set that you get from taking A away from gamma, if that implies B, well, with the context, uh, then gamma already implies, with that context on the right, the downward condition. We need to do something about the case, well, what if A isn't in gamma? Uh, well, if you think about it, set theoretic addition, unioning, the same thing comes up. I mean, we say um, uh, that gamma implies A upward arrow B in case the result of adding A to gamma implies B. Well, what if A is already in gamma? Well, then, then gamma to plus A is just gamma. And so the question is just, well, does gamma imply B? If gamma implies B and gamma contains A, then gamma implies A uh, arrow B. Uh, so we can do just the same thing. We say, uh, if gamma does include A, then we take it out and look at the premise set we get. Uh, if it doesn't include A, 
uh, but it but gamma implies b, then we say, well, downward arrow, a downward arrow b is implied by gamma. Uh, it's sort of a degenerate case, but it's exactly parallel to what we have uh, in the upward case. So that's a well-defined and I think well-motivated right rule for the downward conditional. We need a left rule. Uh, well, what should that be? Uh, this is really where we have room to fiddle. Uh, we don't have, I think, strong sort of intuitions about what the result of adding uh, uh, the conditional on the left should be, except uh, there's really two unget overable uh, features that the left rule has to satisfy. One is detachment. Uh, that is, um, our left rule for the upward conditional has to make it the case that uh, gamma together with A, together with A arrow B implies B. And we want it to be the case that gamma minus A together with A downward arrow B implies B. That would be the uh, detachment principle for a downward conditional. And the other thing is to have the nice, anything like the nice properties that uh, NMMS has, we want it to preserve containment. That is, if the system before we introduce the new connective is such that if A is a, an element of gamma, then gamma implies A. If that's already true, then if gamma contains A downward arrow B, then gamma ought to imply A downward arrow B. Uh, we should preserve uh, containment. So here at the top of the next page, we have uh, a series of desiderata. Uh, we don't want to make the system inconsistent. Uh, we want it to be conservative in the sense that uh, any implications that don't involve the new vocabulary, that don't involve any downward conditionals that held before should still hold. And there shouldn't be any new ones that don't involve uh, the downward conditional. Uh, that is, it should leave the downward arrow free fragment of the reason relations exactly the way they are. It should only affect, the introduction of it should only affect uh, the new stuff. Remember, this was the problem with Tonk, uh, that when you added it, suddenly you could get A to imply B for arbitrary A and B. So we want conservativeness. We want detachment. Uh, we want preservation of CO. And here, this four path independence. Uh, suppose we've got a neighbor of gamma, gamma prime which is just like gamma, except it contains B, which gamma doesn't, and it doesn't have A, which gamma does, right? So it's, so it's, good. It, it's what you get from subtracting A and adding B, or in these set theoretic terms, adding B and subtracting A, it doesn't matter. Well, it ought to be the case that gamma implies A downward arrow, B upward arrow C, just in case it implies B upward arrow, A downward arrow C. Those should give us the same result because those are two ways of going from gamma to gamma prime. That's the path independence. If we're gonna be able to step from arbitrary, from gamma to arbitrary delta, uh, it can't depend 
on which path we take or we're getting different results and we're not accurately encoding the information about what follows from delta in the logically complex consequences of um, gamma. So can we do that? Well, here's some hopeful results. So take one of the hard ones first, uh, CO preservation, that last one. So it's preservation. So we assume that B together with any gamma minus A implies B together with any arbitrary pi. If B is a premise, B is a conclusion. That's uh, CO for less complex things. So we can assume that as a premise. And now by our left rule, uh, A together with, uh, sorry, gamma minus A together with the downward conditional, A downward arrow B implies B. That's a result of this uh, left hand, uh, sorry, this left hand rule just make, make theta B uh, B pi in the application of the left rule. Then in the application of the left rule, the on top of the line, we've got an instance of CO, but uh, below the line, we've got a conclusion that includes B. Uh, and let me point out, this is sort of the next point, that's detachment uh, for the downward conditional. Uh, just by applying the left rule, we uh, can show that detachment holds any time CO holds. But now if we have that detachment result and apply our right-hand uh, rule, you know, we've got gamma together with A downward arrow B minus A, implies B in the context pi. Well, by the right rule, that's sufficient to say that this context, the whole one that we subtracted A from, A is not contained in, in the relevant sense in this sentence, this is just another sentence. Uh, so, so think of all of this gamma together with that conditional as being the gamma in the right, in the right rule. That minus A implies B, context pi. So all of that implies the downward conditional in there. Uh, well, that's to say, if we have the downward conditional on the left, we get it on the right. So it preserves CO. So in this little three-line proof, we've both shown CO preservation and detachment, which suggests we've got a pretty workable left rule. Okay, what about the path independence of downward conditionals? If we first subtract A, get a conditional with that, and then subtract B and get a conditional, do we get the same results, the same things follow from that as if we subtract B, get a conditional, and then subtract A? Uh, that's this claim, that is, we're going to be going from, from um, yeah. So, so this is the the strong uh, path independence result. Uh, if delta equals gamma plus a and minus b we want to show that C follows from delta just in case either of these conditionals hold, but one of them had better hold only if the other one holds, if and only if the other one holds, because that's how the information about whether delta implies C is going to be codified in um, uh, a step up and a step down. Uh, with the conditionals. 
And uh, you know, I started off here showing the left to right route, uh, but it turns out uh, that uh, you can show them both together. Uh, that is, they both uh, they both hold in uh, the same case, uh, gamma A minus B or gamma minus B A, those are just the same, those are just the same things. So in fact, we have the path independence going up uh, and down. And over here on the uh, next page, there's a sort of another version, uh, another version of that. So uh, I conclude that the logically complex consequences of every gamma, logically complex ones now, NMMS rules plus the downward conditional encode the consequences of every delta, whether it's disjoint from gamma, overlaps it as a subset or a superset, because uh, if we let x1 through xn be the set of sentences that are in delta but not in gamma, and y1 to ym be the set of sentences that are in gamma but not in delta, then delta implies a just in case this huge embedded conditional with A as the co ultimate consequence holds. That is, we're going up uh, the Ys to add all the things that are in gamma but not in delta. If adding all those implies, and now we take away all the ones that are in uh, uh, the one but not in the other, uh, downward implies A. And we've shown my claim that we can mix upward and downward conditionals like this uh, and it'll be path independent. That is, A will be the ultimate consequence of this. Uh, so no matter what order we embedded these uh, uh, conditionals in. So uh, looks like we have a monad logic. I was really excited. Uh, but uh, things are not that easy. Uh, here's the worm in the apple. And this is an argument that, uh, you know, I brought this all excited to the logic group where people who actually know how to think about this thing help me. Uh, and Ulf Flobel offered the following argument. It's, it's a nine step argument. He did this off the top of his head. He said, no, I think the problem is gonna be this. And then just said this and I scribbled it down. But to be fair, it is, and I actually have rewritten it since uh, he said it sort of filling in some bits, but this is summarizing problems that Shuhei Shimamura, one of the role members and Dan Kaplan who we've met, wrestled with the last time we made a serious run at implementing a monad logic, which is now, it was in 2015 and 2016, we tried to do this, but we didn't have NMMS then, lots of things were not working at that point, but already um, tried the downward conditional and this was the problem with it. And so uh, let me try and say intuitively what the problem is. For upward conditionals, if you want to know what uh, follows from gamma together with A together with B, you've got at least three ways you can go. You, can, you want to know whether gamma together with A together with B implies C. And you're going to look at the logically complex consequences of gamma to find that out. Well, you can look at whether gamma implies A arrow, B arrow, C, or path independence. You can look at whether gamma implies B arrow, A arrow, C, or you can look at whether gamma implies A and B, the conjunction, arrow, C. And those will always give you the same result. Um, 
Gamma will imply that just in case. Gamma together with A and B implies C. With downward conditionals, you can't trade the sequence of downward conditionals for a big conjunction because uh, gamma minus A conjoined B doesn't have the same effect as removing A and B from gamma. That is, it doesn't have the same effect as removing A and then removing B. Uh, a arrow B, as far as set theoretic subtraction is concerned, is just a different sentence from A and B. And when you remove that, you haven't changed A and B in there. And so though you can change around the order in which you take away A and take away B, you can do take away A first and then B, and get the corresponding conditions, or take away B first and then A, uh, the resulting conditionals will have C as a consequent, just in case gamma minus A minus B implies C, uh, whatever order, and you can uh, extend that to arbitrary, uh, arbitrarily deep embeddings of conditionals. But going up, you can trade that embedding of conditionals inside conditionals inside conditionals for a conditional that just has a conjun conjunctive antecedent. Uh, and going down, you can't because in subtracting a conjunction, you haven't subtract subtracted the conjuncts or vice versa. And that's what we see here. <clears throat> Suppose gamma implies C, where gamma doesn't have A or B in it. Uh, then gamma B here in step two, that's just the same as gamma, so, sorry. Then gamma B implies B downward arrow C, since if you remove B from gamma together with B, you get just gamma, and gamma does imply C. So uh, gamma, if we step up to B, will down B will downward imply uh, C. So gamma together with A and B minus A will still imply uh, B downward arrow C because A isn't in gamma. So this will hold just in case gamma together with B implies the conditional and we just showed that it did. So uh, now, if we apply the right rule again here, uh, because if you take uh, A away from this set, uh, you get this conditional. By applying the, the right rule, we can say, okay, then this implies A downward arrow, B downward arrow, C. But now, if we have gamma, a, B implying anything, by the left rule for conjunction of NMMS, we get gamma together with the conjunction implies that. But now we can unravel this. If gamma together with A and B, uh, it must be by reversing the right rule that this premise set minus A implies this. That's what this says. Uh, and we can do it again uh, to get you know, uh, to move uh, the B uh, over. Uh, and if that's true, since gamma doesn't contain A or B, this just is gamma together with the conjunction. Now we've got that implies C. And again, by reversing. You know, if this conjunction holds, uh, the reversible left rule for conjunction tells us so does this. But now we've gone from gamma implies C to gamma together with arbitrary A and B implies C. Um, and that needn't have held in the, you know, none of those need to involve downward arrows. And there was no reason that just does not follow from this in some. Uh, 
base vocabularies this won't hold. That is, it's not conservative. Uh, if the right rule is reversible. Now, can we do without the reversibility? Well, you sort of get one direction of the codification, but not the other. Um, this is sort of how far we've gotten with this. I don't know how to fix this, to either modify the notion of monologue uh, or the strategy for using downward conditionals to get monadologicality uh, without the reversibility of R, uh, or to deal with this uh, difficulty with conjunction uh, in some other way. I mean, it isn't by itself a big problem if the new rules aren't reversible. What we get for the NMMS rules being reversible is Dan's expressive completeness result uh, that lets us go back and forth between logically complex uh, consequences and features of the underlying base vocabulary, the non-logical, the reason relations governing the non-logical vocabulary. And I at least could live with it if the system that was monadological didn't have that sort of expressive completeness. If we had to give that up in order to get this other kind, okay, then it would be a project to find something that could have both of them, but uh, at least I'd have my monadologic. Um, but uh, can't live with it not being conservative. Uh, are there other manifestations of this difficulty? Uh, not having R be reversible doesn't change the fact that you can't, in the downward conditional, you can't trade a sequence of embedded conditionals for a conjunctive antecedent going down and you can going up because subtracting the conjunction doesn't subtract the conjuncts. Um, so I don't know, but this version comes so close to work that I'm still encouraged and think, you know, this is worth uh, pursuing. But uh, as I sit here right now uh, in this chair and in these trousers, I can't make it work. Uh, so, uh, you know, I report it because the aspiration seems to me uh, uh, important. Maybe it can be done. If it can't be done, then, I mean, if it really can't be done, then that aspiration is not in the end coherent. And maybe it isn't, but why not? You know, then, then we really wanna understand why is that uh, an incoherent expressive aspiration? Uh, so it seems to me we'll learn something either way, but you know, I started off, uh, uh, this session saying, this one's gonna be different from you know, what we presented before. Uh, here I've got something, a result that seems to me motivated, uh, the aspiration for it. Uh, uh, we've got good reasons to think this would be a wonderful thing to have. And it's not that we're without ideas about how we might get there. Uh, there's a strategy, uh, but right now I I can't make it work, and so don't know whether it it or anything like it could be made to work. So anyway, we're not going to go near this in the book, um, but I wanted to um, commend the aspiration to your attention. Uh, there's a sense in which it would be the nucleus ultra of uh, logical expressivism to produce a monad logic. Uh, and I also don't know that we can't. So, uh, so here's where we are. Okay. Uh, last class is next week. Uh, I want to sort of rehearse 
what we've done and draw conclusions uh, from it. Uh, the reason relations are at the center of what now is the tetrahedron. Uh, and I want to rehearse sort of what we've learned about the relations between reason relations and a dialogic pragmatics, uh, uh, an expressive logical metavocabulary, uh, and various kinds of semantic uh, metavocabulary. Um, there, many of the pieces of this system interdigitate in a satisfying way. And I want to draw some, rehearse uh, uh, some of those ways and draw some conclusions from it uh, and address some of the large questions about the nature of language, of reasons and discursive practice that I began uh, with in my introductory uh, remarks. So uh, that's for next time. No new substantive uh, material there, only chit chat about what we've already seen uh, and sort of what it comes to. So uh, that's, that's for next time. Uh, those of you who can dance with the Python, you know, free, the Python program is free. There's good IDEs. I use PyCharm uh, myself that are free. Uh, you probably you know, learned to do this as an undergraduate. Uh, the code's on the, uh, on the website now, so uh, you can play with it if you want to. Okay, uh, be safe and I'll see you next week. <laughs>